Video game adaptations aren't very good. That's not a very unpopular opinion to hold, but one that would be is that most people are generally clueless as to why this actually is. Why video game movies suck is something that is either oversimplified or overcomplicated depending on the person you ask, when in reality it's the premise of the question that is inherently flawed, and today I'd like to shed light on many of the misunderstandings that I feel these films and their criticisms face. Why video game movies suck is a trick question. They suck for the same reasons that all other movies suck. Poor writing and bad direction. The real, and more interesting question, is why have video games had such a hard time translating into good films? Video game films are never going to be great as a general rule because video games are not designed to tell stories. They're designed to be great games. Sometimes they use story to drive the games, but they aren't structured in a narrative uh, like a true narrative. And as a result, you end up with a muddled story that doesn't translate well to film. This is the first and most preposterous concept that I'd like to tear down as I make my overarching point about the quality of these films. The idea that video game movies are not good because the plots to the games are not good and therefore the films will suck as a result crumbles upon any technical literary scrutiny. All works of fiction, be it novels, films, games, Start with an idea. The idea is then expanded upon and a plot is created through the creativity and imagination of the author. What most people don't seem to get is that the plots to video games are not really exclusively and thematically plots to video games. Anyone could write a book about a lost city beneath the sea. Anyone could write a screenplay about a murderous family. And astute viewers will note that these things have already been done. A concept is exactly that, a concept, and the notion that all video game concepts are automatically bad because they are video game concepts makes no sense at all. Are there games that are so out there that they'd likely be poor live action movies? Absolutely, sure. But the critics of these movies will only understand that admission and not realize that this isn't a video game problem. Every genre has works that will adapt poorly to the properties of other genres in the medium. Would Bayonetta be a great live action film? Probably not. But would Black Swan be a good video game? No, it wouldn't. I hate the fact that we keep adapting video games to movies and all the video game fans keep going, I can't wait to see a movie based on my favorite video game. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, you know what? It's not going to be awesome. You know the plot that you're so in love with from that game? That is simply a series of cutscenes that are meant to link you shooting sh in one scene to you shooting sh in another scene. There is no real plot there. Resident Evil is about a dude or a chick you get to choose stuck in a house with zombies. That's the whole plot. No, there's this deep story about the Umbrella Corporation. No, there's not. The reason it was stupid series of f***ing movies is because it was a, a video game that was very light on plot. The generalization of all video game plots being bad because games aren't narrative centric is already fairly ignorant, but the argument that video game plots are bad and will adapt poorly because they're simple is intellectual dishonesty at its finest. Anything can sound simple and stupid if we boil it down to its most basic elements. Dude hunts robots. Guy has imaginary friend. Man, dressed as bat, fights clown. There's a reason I chose The Dark Knight as one of these examples, and it'll become more obvious later, but for now, let's speak about a serious underlying issue that was mentioned by C. Robert Cargill, and that's the pacing of video games and how gameplay can present itself as a problem in adaptations. Although I think there is merit in wondering how a video game adaptation will be good when a game is intrinsically a series of gameplay sequences divided by story sections, I would like to plainly state that I don't believe this issue is complicated at all, and its answer is quite obvious. While I believe that many of Cargill's critiques are aimed at older games where story was far less of a focus than it is in modern games today, the fact that those games have a story is the point. Unlike multiplayer games which have infinite playability because they're structured entirely around gameplay, single player games have a beginning and an end. 
What gets you to the end from the beginning is the framework that composes a game's narrative integrity, as the gameplay is a necessary passage of time that just happens to be interactive. Resident Evil, for example, is a game that takes place in a single night. You start outside the mansion. You enter the mansion. You discover the zombies. You make your way to the dormitory. You return to the mansion. Then you discover the underground umbrella lab where the game ends after you defeat the tyrant. You may say that's an extremely linear set of events that in no way would make a good film, but let's compare that to an actual film. Don't Breathe is a movie that takes place in a single night. It starts outside a house, the characters enter the house, the characters discover the blind man, then they discover the basement, then they go back outside, then they go back inside, where the movie ends after they defeat the blind man. Structurally, there is little difference between these two examples. What makes them different is what happens between the events that push the story forward. And this is where the real issue with video game movies begins to rear its head. And then I, I started to get into the idea of, uh, you know, what is a video game adaptation? You know, there have, have been hundreds and thousands of, uh, you know, adaptations of novels or literature, but there have only been, a, you know, a few video game adaptations ever. And so I started to sort of get into it, like, you know, what makes a video game movie different from a regular movie? I said that most movies are bad because of two things, those being poor writing and bad direction. This is the part of the critique where we look at the filmmakers and dissect their decisions in adapting games. One of the mistakes that some filmmakers tend to keep making with these movies, as you just heard, is thinking that there is a difference between a video game movie and a regular movie. There isn't, nor should there be. A movie is a movie, and if you're adapting a video game, your goal should be to extract the elements that told the story and adapt and change them if necessary to create a compelling film. Again, this is just one of many misunderstandings that filmmakers have had with these films, and the changing them if necessary caveat to the goal I just laid out is another. Most video game plots aren't very good. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, obviously. However, a lot of the time, the plot of games just aren't good enough to be adapted into movies. If you'd like proof to back up my claim, I have a lot of examples you can look at. Most video game movies literally just adapt the plot of the game. This is horseshit. What filmmakers usually opt to do is adapt the concept of the games, as I mentioned previously, then go from there. It's easy to blame the concept as to why the film is bad, and that's how you arrive at the complaint that video game plots are bad, so the films are bad, but it's what's done with these concepts by the writers and directors where the films falter. Silent Hill is a game about a father who loses his daughter in a ghost town. Silent Hill is also a movie about a mother who loses her daughter in a ghost town. And that's about the only similarity between these two, because the film changes the protagonist, the protagonist's reason for coming to Silent Hill, the reason behind Cheryl's existence, it omits key characters such as Lisa and Kaufman, it adds several characters, and in the process homogenizes the cult from the game, and in the process of doing all that, becomes something entirely different from its source material. Similarly, Tomb Raider is both a game and a movie about an aspiring archaeologist who ends up shipwrecked on a strange island, but the movie omits the crew of the Endurance, changes Matthias's entire character, introduces Trinity, and changes the lore of Himiko. So, why do these changes happen, and why do a lot of them not work? Well, as a critic, anytime I want to talk about a game, I play through it, sometimes more than once, and subsequently live with the game in my mind for an extremely long time before my content is released. I do not, after listening to hours upon hours of commentary tracks, get the sense that the people who work on these movies have played, much less understand the games they're adapting. Part of the reason there's an undying hope for these movies is because we have fallen in love with the identities of these games. We want to see them adapted because they'll literally get brought to life and that's a totally new way to experience something you love. Unfortunately, a filmmaker who hasn't played the game can only really do that on a visual level, and any narrative changes they'll make are subconsciously based on what makes sense to them 
versus what makes sense for the story. I'm fairly confident at this point that Paul W.S. Anderson believes that the zombie outbreak in Resident Evil 2 is directly tied to the outbreak from Resident Evil 1. If anyone played the video game, uh, they'll know that the very first video game was set in the mansion um, after the escape of the T-Virus. Um, and really the way the first movie functioned would be as a prequel to the world of the video game, explaining how that virus escaped and all the events leading up to the first video game. The second film I had always intended would take place during exactly the same timeline as one of the video games, uh, which was Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. And then the third movie would be like a postscript to the world of the video games, kind of, I think, taking the world of the video games to their end logical conclusion, which is the Umbrella Corporation eventually would be unable to contain the virus any longer, and it would get out and infect the entire world. But anyone who's played the games can tell you that's not true, and Ada flat out explains why that isn't the case when she speaks to Annette in the second game. Based on this misunderstanding seems to be how we got the storyline from the Resident Evil films, and Anderson admits as much. In the very first game, you go into the, the woods and there's a mansion and below it is a high-tech research facility. And it's all overrun with undead and mutants and creatures, but it's never really explained what's happened. You know, the backstory to that is never really explained. And that's what the movie does, is the movie kind of is the lead up, is the prequel to the very first game. Now, some people find these changes inherently damning to these films, some think they're necessary in order to adapt a game, but what everyone needs to realize is that changes in these movies are not definitive or representative in their nature regarding quality. That just because a change was made means that that change is the only change that could have existed, so video game movies must be bad because all these definitive changes which may have ruined or helped the film were the only ideas available. That may be a bit confusing, so let me elaborate. In the Silent Hill movie, I dislike the depiction of the Order. I think making them postmodern religious zealots does a disservice to the film, and the order in the games is far more interesting. I could look at this change as something definitive, something that must have happened in order for the Silent Hill game to be adapted. But this is a mistake, and so is thinking that this change, because I dislike it and think it must have happened, is proof that video game movies are bad because they tried to adapt a game by changing its core elements out of necessity and failed. Conversely, I cannot look at this change and think it is bad because it's a change. Changes are bad in their own specific context, not because they're changes. In the new Tomb Raider movie, I think the depiction of Laura as someone who is running from her past due to the hurt of the loss of her father is interesting and executed well despite that not being the Laura in the game reboot. The quality of these changes is entirely dependent on the quality of the writing, and although I do truly believe that someone who hasn't played a game is more likely to make a bad movie based on that game, it's really entirely up to the talent of the writer. If you asked me what a Titanfall movie would have looked like in 2015, I genuinely have no idea what to tell you because the story of the game was predominantly told through exposition and voiceovers. But then Titanfall 2 came out, and with only a multiplayer narrative to go by, someone created BT, Cooper, and their amazing relationship while still perfectly integrating the conflict of the first game of the IMC versus the Militia. We praise the narrative of Titanfall 2 because the writing makes you care about the characters, which of course isn't exclusive to a video game at all, and I'd argue that Titanfall 2 would make a fine film just based off the plot of the game from beginning to end. What you lose in the translation from game to film is the interactivity, but what you replace it with is entirely up to you as a director or a writer. In fact, the guys who did Max Payne had the right idea. If you're gonna make a, a movie out of a video game, you have to be very careful because you're taking control away from the player. So what are you going to replace that with? And I was hoping that we would always push Max forward and we would make the player, or rather the viewer, feel like he was uh, always in control uh, of the situation, which is what you need, you need to replace that, uh, that ultimate sense of control. 
Of course, Max Payne isn't a good movie, but it's not a bad movie because Max Payne is a bad game. It's a bad movie because they ignored what made Max Payne Max Payne, and what they replaced it with was boring as shit. And that's why video game movies have had such a hard time adapting to film. The final 20 minutes of Max Payne are balls to the wall action that viscerally and majestically capture the action of the game, but the rest of the film is bland and soulless, and even though Mark Wahlberg is trying his best, he's given no material to work with despite the material being right there in the game. The Resident Evil movie, instead of giving us interesting horror mystery as established by the first game, gives us a mediocre zombie flick that should have been amazing because it's actually an allegory of Alice in Wonderland. But Paul W.S. Anderson didn't fully commit to that idea, so it has no resolution. I wish he had, because that's honestly pretty cool. The Hive was Wonderland, Kaplan was the White Rabbit, Spencer was the Mad Hatter, and of course, Alice was Alice. See, I don't begrudge the idea that this is different from Resident Evil 1. I genuinely think that this sort of illusion fits right at home in a Resident Evil game, but again, the movie doesn't commit to this illusion, so it doesn't really have any meaning, and what we're left with is cheesy zombie action, which is not the core or the appeal of Resident Evil. The Silent Hill film is where I think we've come closest to a great video game movie. Every time I wonder what the video game movie that is incredible will look like, I see flashes of it in Silent Hill. No, Silent Hill doesn't have Harry Mason as its protagonist, but Radha Mitchell's performance as Rose brings to life the potential loss of a child better than the first game ever could as well as a genuine fear to the repulsive nature of the other world. It nails the isolation of Silent Hill, not just because of the amazing visuals, but because it creates atmosphere by reusing the music from the games. And that doesn't work in the movie because we associate the music with the games, it works because Akira Yamaoka's ambience-infused industrial tracks fit the desolate atmosphere from the game, so they'll obviously fit the desolate atmosphere of the movie. Silent Hill fails by playing its cards too early with its religious overtones and imagery, where you can see its twist and motivation of characters from a mile away, stripping it of any of the game's ambiguity or nuance. But even with these choices, what works in the film works because it's adapted well from the game by Roger Avery's screenplay, which is no surprise because it's Roger Avery's screenplay. See, video game movies have had a hard time translating well to film, not because the plots of the games are bad or simple, and not because the changes in translation are an innate negative. They've had a hard time translating because the people they're getting to make these movies aren't very fucking good. And even if they are good, that doesn't mean that every film they do is going to be a masterpiece. Any adaptation of any property comes with its risks and challenges. But there's nothing special about video games outside of fringe cases which we already covered that would prevent them from being decent films except the people who are making them. What no one will tell you is that most people hold video game movies to a ridiculously high standard while not even realizing how moronic it is to generalize the films without any context as to who made them. He who shall not be named has never made a good movie, and he never will because he's awful. So why are we looking at his video game movies and saying, yeah, video games are the problem, not him. Similarly, I think Paul W.S. Anderson is the worst director working, and yet we look at his movies and think, yeah, video games are the problem and not the fact that Anderson thinks that people don't want to see one-to-one -one video game adaptations because we've already played the game. Again, we've always seen the films as kind of living in exactly the same universe as the games, sometimes telling slightly different stories with slightly different characters, but kind of using, you know, using locations from the games, using characters from the games, you know, not being a slavish, um, just a slavish kind of interpretation of the games, because I always thought that that would be a very boring thing to do. And also, you know, these are very scary movies, so to, uh, for people who had played the video game, it would be kind of a boring experience to, to know exactly which character is going to die at which point at the hands of which creatures. There would be no suspense there.
Um, it would be very much like uh, you know watching Alien for the first time and already knowing that a chest burster is going to come out of John Hurt's stomach, uh, that Sigourney Weaver is going to be the sole survivor at the end of the film. You know, it would really rob that movie of any tension. The first game has a set of characters, and then the sequel actually follows a completely different set of characters in a different location. You know, they're not in a mansion in the woods anymore, they're in a nearby city, Raccoon City, which is all abandoned. When you look at all the games taken together, you know, it was a really wide range of characters in different locations following different storylines. And that kind of made an adaptation extra challenging because, you know, if you go and do an adaptation of Resident Evil 1, you risk alienating all the people who love Resident Evil 2 and the characters of Resident Evil 2. So if you're watching a straight adaptation of Resident Evil 1, the game, there's no suspense. You know who can, who's going to live, who's going to die. You know what the story is. Um, and, and I felt that would make a very unsatisfying adaptation because why not just go and play the game again? The most baffling thing about the criticisms against video game movies is that good video game movies already exist. Taking characters from an established universe and putting them in a movie-only situation against a movie-only villain seemed to work out really well for this little film called Dread. You can look at Dread and just go down the list of complaints about video game movies like significant changes to source material narrative, but it doesn't matter because what Dread doesn't retain from its 2000 AD comic counterpart, it makes up for with its amazing action, character development, and fantastic portrayal of Judge Dread. If Dread could pull a great movie out of a setting and only two characters belonging to its source material, you're telling me video games can't do the same? They absolutely can, but the distinction is that comic book movies like Dread got good when talented people started working on them. And that finally brings us back to The Dark Knight. I can just feel the smug and arrogant looks that some faces have to have right now as I propose the insane idea that any video game movie could be as good as The Dark Knight but just stop for a second and think about what The Dark Knight is. The Dark Knight is a movie that takes characters from another medium of entertainment without adapting any specific prior storyline. So, do those video game movies that deviate so heavily from the games they're adapting suck because the plot to the games they're not even trying to adapt are bad? Or are they bad because the people working on them are hacks and their terrible movies are reflective of their talent, just like a good director's work is reflective of theirs. Marvel Avengers bullshit.